Welcome listeners, but take heed. We will say whatever we need to share our knowledge, thoughts, and joy, and even things that do annoy. So join us now, but be aware, we have a tendency to swear. We'll dial it back a little bit, but frankly, we don't give a shit. Welcome to Just Keep Rolling, a Harry Potter book movie compare and contrast podcast. Give me an E! Give me an L! Give me another L! Give me another E! Give me an N! What's that spell? Your host, Ellen! That was, that was just Ellen. You Like, you just spelled Ellen. The rest was implied, Katie. Sure. Okay. Well, let's just keep rolling into the rolling rehash. Last week, we covered Chapter 13, Mad-Eye Moody, and a film scene that didn't remotely correspond. School's back! Trelawney incorrectly guesses Harry's birthday, which is odd since it's probably a national banking holiday in the wizarding world. Professor Sprout debates starting a YouTube channel of squeezing boobatuber pus. Hagrid has his class raising the nopiest nopes that ever noped. Ron wants to see Uranus, while we just want to see Ron's sarcasm. When it comes to Yo Mama jokes, Draco finds the consequences aren't fair at all. <laughs> fair it. Fair it all. <sighs> And Moody would clearly rather ask for forgiveness than permission, and that makes him even cooler. During episode 77, Stingers and Suckers and Spark Farts, oh my, our Potter pondering was, do you think Igor Karkaroff went to Durmstrang or Hogwarts? Dave thinks Durmstrang. He thinks he was being sarcastic or condescending with the dear old Hogwarts comment. You know, the wizarding equivalent of, bless his heart. (laughs) Kylie also thinks Durmstrang. The dear old Hogwarts thing could have been just to be polite or sarcastic. She's sure Voldemort recruited Durmstrang since they teach the dark arts. Which makes sense. Mm -hmm. Lisa Lotta also believes Durmstrang. He must have visited Hogwarts at least once, and he's obviously familiar with Dumbledore as he appears rather informal. She also agrees with Dave that the dear old Hogwarts comment could have been meant as a condescending remark. Mike also went with Durmstrang. Karkaroff sounds more like a Bulgarian name, so it would make sense that he'd stay local. And the dark arts forward teaching there would definitely have made him more open to death eatering. Or murder munchering. As we like to say, yes. (laughs) (laughs) Juliana also said Durmstrang too. I'm noticing a pattern. Right? (laughs) She would expect that the wizarding school staff would have attended that school. His first name is of Slavic origin, and his last name is a mix of Turkish and Slavic. But he did say dear old Hogwarts, inferring that he's at least visited Hogwarts before. Quincy thinks he may have gone to Durmstrang. It just really always made sense to him because of the accent. He feels like he wouldn't have had such a thick accent if he had gone to Hogwarts. But he thinks he says dear old Hogwarts because they used to judge the Triwizard back in the day. But anyways, that scene where he snuck into the Great Hall was bullshit. That's all. Fuck! And fuck that fucking tongue flick! (laughs) That was fun to say. Thank you, Quincy. I don't think he agrees with us that adding the tongue flick during that scene would have made it better. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) I guess we'll agree to disagree on that one. Yeah. Claire agrees with Quincy, though maybe not on the tongue thing. We'd have to get her direct opinion on that. Sure, we're not positive. (laughs) But she thinks that they said the Triwizard Tournament hadn't been done in years, so he couldn't have gone to Hogwarts when he was a student at Durmstrang if Hogwarts hosted. It also depends on how long he's been headmaster. Plus, he could have been a teacher there during his Death Eater years and visited Hogwarts then. It's also a pretty famous school, so he could have just been being condescending. Or it could be because Hogwarts is one of the oldest schools. Because Ilvermorny was created after Hogwarts was, 10th century. So it could have been the same with Durmstrang, Middle Ages, which spans a long amount of time. Mm -hmm. Jackson thinks it was more likely Durmstrang, being from Eastern Europe, it's most likely. Yeah. But not everybody thought it was Durmstrang. Well, he's always just got to be different, doesn't he? Max theorized that if Karkaroff was a Death Eater in the last Wizarding War, then he was probably recruited at Hogwarts. He'd say he was definitely old enough to be there around the time Lucius was. Hmm. Kendra said she wonders, though. 
He may have gone to Hogwarts, got caught up in the Voldemort crowd, and then fled after betraying the Death Eaters in that court scene you see in Book 6. And that has him now living and working at Durmstrang. Sure, he was from Europe, but that doesn't mean that his parents didn't move to England when he was young. That's kind of was my line of thinking. Yeah. Robert thinks it's possible for Karkaroff to have gone to both Hogwarts and Durmstrang. Ooh. Possibly getting transferred to Durmstrang due to parents' change of profession. He couldn't have been a previous judge or competitor for the Triwizard Tournament because the last one to take place before Goblet was in 1792. Hmm. Seems most people figure that he went to Durmstrang, but a few of our keepers are also on Team Hogwarts. I'm still Team Hogwarts. Yeah. All in all, great insight, though. I agree. This is really fun to read. Our trivia question last week was, what book did Professor Moody lend Neville? Harry and Ron find Neville in their dormitory reading Magical Mediterranean Water Plants and Their Properties, a book that he tells them Professor Moody lent him because Professor Sprout said he was good at herbology. Congratulations again goes to both Mike Riley and Max Nash. What? Both of them had sucky internet, so they still managed to hold on to tying each other. That's impressive. Yeah. Mike is on his sixth week in a row, and Max is up to two. Mm. But being the holder of the previous record tied with Quincy, I don't think he's too worried yet. Not too, well, I mean, he's got two more weeks. Yeah. So we'll see. I can't wait to see if they tie next week or if one of them will edge out the other. Or if someone else will get in there and answer correctly first. Yeah, who knows? Oh, be so crazy. For now, let's just keep rolling into Chapter 14, The Unforgivable Curses and the Corresponding Film Scenes. Chapter 14, The Unforgivable Curses. The next few days are relatively calm, aside from Neville managing to melt his sixth cauldron in potions. Snape seems extra vindictive after the summer and gave him a detention where he had to disembowel a barrel full of horned toads. Ron and Harry theorize that Snape is in such a bad mood because of Moody, and again because he missed out on the Defense Against the Dark Arts teaching position. However, Snape seems a little scared of Moody as he is strangely reluctant to display any overt animosity. The Gryffindor fourth years are all really looking forward to their first lesson with Moody, so they show up early on Thursday and line up outside his classroom even before the bell. Hermione shows up at the last minute, and Harry finishes her explanation that she had been in the library. They hurry into the classroom and the three seats right in front of the teacher's desk, pulling out their copies of The Dark Forces, A Guide to Self-Protection, and waiting unusually quietly. They hear Moody's distinctive clunking walk before he enters the room, looking as strange and frightening as ever. He tells them to put their books away, which makes Ron very excited. Moody takes out a register and calls out their names, fixing his magical eye on each student as they respond. He finishes with attendance and mentions that a letter from Professor Lupin states that they have thoroughly covered dark creatures, listing off boggarts, redcaps, hinky punks, grindylows, kappas, and werewolves. After a murmured assent, Moody goes on to say that they are very behind on dealing with curses and says that he has one year to bring them up to scratch. Ron blurts out, upset that he isn't staying, but Moody smiles and addresses him as Arthur Weasley's son. He tells Ron that his dad got him out of a tight spot a few days ago, but reiterates that he's only staying one year as a special favor to Dumbledore. He claps his hands and goes straight into curses, explaining that the Ministry thinks he should only teach them counter curses and leave it at that. They aren't supposed to see any illegal dark curses until their sixth year, but Dumbledore and he think they can handle it now, and the sooner the better. As he explains that they need to know what they're up against to be prepared, he interrupts himself to lecture Lavender, who's showing Parvati her completed horoscope under the desk. She blushes, and Moody continues on to ask if anyone knows which curses are most heavily punished by wizarding law. Several hands go up, including Ron's and Hermione's. Moody calls on Ron, who tentatively says that his dad told him about one, called the Imperious Curse. Moody agrees that Ron's dad would know about that one, since it gave the Ministry a lot of trouble at one time. He opens his desk drawer and pulls out a glass jar holding three large black spiders. 
Ron slightly recoils as Moody reaches into the jar and pulls out one of the spiders. He holds it out in the palm of his hand and points his wand at it, muttering Imperio. The spider leaps from his hand on a thread of fine silk and swings back and forth like it's on a trapeze, before breaking the thread with a backflip and landing on the desk. It begins to cartwheel in circles, and with another jerk of Moody's wand, it rises onto two legs and into an unmistakable tap dance. Everyone starts laughing, except for Moody, who wants to know if they would still think it was funny if he did it to them. The class immediately stops laughing as Moody continues, explaining that it gives him total control. He could make the spider jump out of a window, drown itself, or throw itself down one of their throats. Ron shudders again as Moody tells them that years back, a lot of witches and wizards were being controlled by the Imperious Curse, and it was a tough job for the Ministry to sort out who was being controlled and who was acting of their own accord. He shares that the curse can be fought and he will be teaching them how to, but it's best to avoid being hit with it. He startles the class by yelling, CONSTANT VIGILANCE, and then puts the spider back in the jar before asking for another curse. Hermione again raises her hand, but Harry is surprised to see that Neville does as well. Moody calls on Neville, who nervously names the Cruciatus Curse. Moody looks at him very intently with both eyes as he confirms that he is Longbottom. Neville nods and turns back to the jar of spiders, reaching for a second one. He places it on the desk and uses Engorgio to make it larger than a tarantula. Ron backs his chair away as far from the giant spider as possible as Moody raises his wand and mutters Crucio. Immediately, the spider begins to twitch horribly and rock side to side. Despite not making any sound, Harry is sure that it would have been screaming if it could. Moody holds his wand in place, causing the spider to jerk more violently until Hermione shrieks for him to stop. She isn't looking at the spider, though. She's looking at Neville, who looks absolutely horrified. Moody raises his wand, and though the spider relaxes, it's still twitching. He says reducio to shrink the spider and returns it to the jar. He addresses the class, telling them that they don't need thumbscrews or knives to torture someone if you can perform the Cruciatus Curse. He asks if anyone knows any other ones, and Harry looks around the room, seeing everyone wondering what was going to happen to the last spider. Hermione's hand shakes slightly as she raises it, and Moody calls on her. She whispers Avada Kedavra, and people look uneasily at her. Moody acknowledges that's the last and worst of the Dark Curses, also known as the Killing Curse. He retrieves the frantic third spider, places it on his desk, and raises his wand. He roars a vada kedavra, and with a flash of green light, the spider rolls onto its back, unmarked but clearly dead. Moody explains that there is no counter curse, no blocking it, saying only one known person has ever survived it and he's sitting right in front of him. Everyone looks at Harry as he tries to ignore them, realizing for the first time how his parents died, despite picturing their deaths over and over again for the past three years. From his encounters with the Dementors the previous year, he knows that Wormtail betrayed his parents and his father died first, trying to hold Voldemort off so his wife and son could get away. Then Voldemort asked Lily to step aside, but she wouldn't, so he killed her too. Harry distantly hears Moody's voice, and realizing that he's speaking again, he pulls himself back to the present to listen. Moody is explaining that Avada Kedavra is a curse that needs a lot of power behind it, so he doubts he'd even get a nosebleed if any of them tried it on him, but he's not there to teach them how to do it, he's there to help them appreciate the worst. He again roars constant vigilance, causing the whole class to jump for a second time. He goes on to tell them that the three curses are known as the unforgivable curses, and the use of any of them on a fellow human is enough to earn a lifetime sentence in Azkaban. He then instructs them to get out their quills, and they spend the rest of the class taking notes about each of the unforgivable curses. At the end of class, everyone leaves and begins discussing them. Harry feels like they are talking about the lesson like it was a spectacular show, but he had not found it very entertaining, and neither had Hermione. She hurries him and Ron along so they can check on Neville, who's standing alone in the corridor, staring at the stone wall, still looking horrified. 
When Hermione says his name, he responds in an unnaturally high voice and seems a little disoriented. Before they can find out if he's okay, Moody clunks up behind them and asks Neville to join him for some tea. He asks Harry if he's all right too, and Harry gives a defiant yes. Moody tells them that it may seem harsh, but they've got to know, and he ushers Neville back to his office. Ron wonders what that was all about, and when Hermione says she doesn't know, he changes the subject to talk about the lesson too. He catches the look on Harry's face when he brings up Avada Kedavra and falls silent until they reach the Great Hall when he says they better start on Professor Trelawney's predictions that night. Hermione eats her food furiously fast and rushes off to the library again, leaving Harry and Ron to walk back to the Gryffindor Tower together. This time it's Harry who brings up the unforgivable curses, wondering if Moody and Dumbledore would be in trouble for showing them. Ron thinks they probably would, but says that Dumbledore has always done things his way and Moody has been getting into trouble for years. He gives the password and the fat lady swings open to let them into their common room, where they decide to get their divination things. Up in their dormitory, they find Neville, who seems calmer but has very red eyes. Harry asks if he's all right, and Neville tells him that he's fine just reading the book Professor Moody lent him, Magical Water Plants of the Mediterranean. Professor Sprout had told Moody that Neville was good at herbology, so Moody thought he'd like it. Harry thought that was a very tactful way of cheering Neville up, and that it seemed like something Professor Lupin would have done. He and Ron take their copies of Unfogging the Future back downstairs and begin working on their predictions for the coming month. After an hour and little progress, they decide to just start making things up. Ron suggests putting in loads of misery and Trelawney will lap it up. After predicting a cough, burns, loss of a treasured possession, being stabbed in the back by a friend, coming off worse in a fight, losing a bet, and steadily more tragic predictions, Harry notices Fred and George hidden away in a corner, working silently on something. As he watches them, he hears George quietly say that they have to be careful because that sounds like they are accusing him. George then notices Harry watching, so Harry gives him a little grin and gets back to work so he isn't caught eavesdropping. Shortly after, the twins roll up the parchment and go to bed. After about ten more minutes, Hermione climbs into the common room carrying a sheaf of parchment and a box that rattles as she walks. She says hello and tells them that she's just finished, and Ron declares that he has as well. Hermione looks at his predictions and points out that he seems to be drowning twice, so Ron decides to change it to getting rampaged by a hippogriff. Hermione thinks it's obvious they made them up, and Ron pretends to be upset, claiming they've been working like house elves. She raises her eyebrows and he backpedals, saying it's just an expression. And Harry, having just predicted his own death by decapitation, changes the subject by asking her what's in the box. She lifts the lid and shows them about 50 badges of different colors, bearing the letters S-P-E-W. Harry wants to know what spew is about, and Hermione corrects him that it's S-P-E-W, and it stands for the Society for the Promotion of Elfish Welfare, and is a group she just started. She ignores Ron as he tries to tell her that they like being enslaved, and says that their short-term aims are to secure house elves fair wages and working conditions. Long-term includes changing the laws about non-wand use and getting house elf representation in the Department for the Regulation and Control of Magical Creatures. Harry wonders how they're going to do all of this, and she says they need to recruit more members for two sickles each. She tells them that Ron is the treasurer and Harry is the secretary and should be writing everything down as a record of their first meeting. There's a moment of silence that's broken by the arrival of Hedwig, who has finally returned with a response from Sirius. Harry reads the very short letter and learns that Sirius is flying north immediately, as there have been strange rumors. He tells him to go straight to Dumbledore if his scar hurts again. He's gotten Mad-Eye out of retirement, so he's reading the signs even if no one else is. Harry regrets telling him about his scar hurting, worried that he could get caught if he comes back, and snaps at Hedwig that he doesn't have any food for her. She flies off offended, and Hermione starts trying to talk to him, but Harry cuts her off and says he's going to bed. He heads upstairs and gets into his pajamas and four-poster, but can't fall asleep, still worrying that if Sirius gets caught, it will be all his fault. Ron comes up a short while later, but no one says anything. 
The dormitory is completely silent, and Harry is too preoccupied to realize that the absence of Neville's usual snores means he isn't the only one lying awake. The movie scene starts out showing the fourth year silently staring up at Professor Alistair Moody as he writes his name on the blackboard and introduces himself to the class as the new Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher. He says that he is there because Dumbledore asked him to be and states that he will not be expounding on that fact, before asking if there are any other questions. Everyone continues to stare blankly at him and he continues speaking, saying that he believes in a practical approach to the dark arts. He then asks if anyone can tell him how many unforgivable curses there are. Hermione solemnly speaks up to say there are three, and he writes that on the board as he asks why they are named that. Hermione explains that they are unforgivable, and Moody continues her line of thought to say that using them will earn you a one-way ticket to Azkaban. He goes on to say that the Ministry thinks they are too young to see what these curses do, but he says differently. His voice becomes more intense as he declares that they need to know what they are up against and to be prepared. In the same breath, he also tells Seamus that he needs to find a different place to put his chewing gum, aside from the underside of his desk. Seamus is shocked that he can see out of the back of his head, and Moody responds by saying he can also hear across classrooms and throws his chalk at him. He then readdresses the class and asks which curse they should see first. Approaching Ron, he orders him to stand and give him an unforgivable curse. Ron says that his dad did tell him about one and mentions the imperious curse. Moody confirms that Ron's dad would know about that one since it gave the ministry quite a bit of trouble a few years ago. In order to demonstrate why, he turns towards a table in front of the chalkboard and pulls a spider out of a glass canister. He enlarges it with Engorgio and casts Imperio on the now palm-sized spider. He then controls it, sending it hopping around the room, landing on various students. He tells them not to worry, it's completely harmless, but if she bites, it's lethal. He continues to send it around the room with a maniacal chuckle. Several of the students laugh as well, until the spider lands on them, and then Moody makes darker suggestions for what he could make the spider do. He sends her to the window and says he could make her jump out of it. He dangles her over a bucket of water and says he could make her drown herself. He guides her back to his hand and tells the class that scores of witches and wizards claimed that they only did the Dark Lord's bidding because they were under the imperious curse. And the issue is sorting out the liars. He asks for another and calls on Neville Longbottom. Neville looks extremely nervous as he stands, and Moody reassures him by telling him that Professor Sprout tells him that he has an aptitude for herbology. Neville nods and stutters as he mentions the Cruciatus curse. Moody says correct and calls Neville forward to his spider on the table. He refers to it as the torture curse and casts Crucio on the spider, which begins shrieking in pain. Neville's face twists in anguish and he watches the spider recoil. He closes his eyes and turns away, prompting Hermione to yell for Moody to stop, because it is bothering him. Moody stops torturing the spider, picks it up, and walks over to Hermione. He lays it on her desk in front of her and asks for the last unforgivable curse. She tearfully shakes her head, so Moody just says, Avada Kedavra, and kills the spider directly in front of her. He explains that it is the killing curse. Only one person has been known to have survived it, and he is sitting in this room. He walks over to Harry, who looks up at him as he searches for something in his pockets. His tongue briefly flicks to the corner of his mouth, and he pulls out his hip flask to take a swig. The scene cuts to the students heading out of class and down the stairs as Ron talks about how brilliant Moody is, though demented. You can tell he's really been there. As they continue down the stairs, Hermione expresses how upset she is about the unforgivable curses being performed in a classroom and asks if they saw Neville's face. They walk up behind him staring at a stained glass window and stop to see how he is. Before they can say anything beyond his name, Professor Moody joins them and invites Neville for tea, telling him there's something he would like to show him. Neville follows him back up the stairs and the trio walk off. The camera focuses on the stained glass window, which shows a picture of a sad-looking person and rain falling behind the glass. It zooms in and a drop of rain trickles down the face on the outside, looking like a tear falling. A good chunk of this book is actually directly portrayed in the movie. What? There are some minor changes. Well, yeah. But the main gist not only gets across, 
it even stays pretty true to form. I mean, they even start out in basically the same place. What's going on? Right? The book just gives a basic intro with some fun details for Flair, like how everything is relatively calm aside from Neville melting his six cauldron in potions. Snape seemed extra vindictive after the summer and had Neville disemboweling a barrel of horned toads in detention. Ew. So I love Neville and I think Snape is horrible to him. But as a teacher, I also can't imagine dealing with a student that keeps melting cauldrons. Well, I mean, but maybe he keeps melting cauldrons because he's so nervous that Snape is going to fucking make him disembowel toads. Yeah, but he messes up things in other classes as well. Yeah, but again, I don't think he would be as bad of a student if he had, like, the proper people backing him. I mean, I think McGonagall's good to him and he still struggles in her class. Yeah. I say we blame his grandmother. I vote a definite resounding yes on that because she's a bitch. And then again, we need to remove Snape from the classroom. Yes, exactly. But that's a that's a totally different episode. <laughs> <laughs> Ron and Harry figure that Snape is in such a bad mood because of Moody and again missing out on the defense against the Dark Arch teaching position. Which, I mean, I'm sure that had something to do with it. Oh, definitely. Mm-hmm. But it's funny that the teacher who teaches defense against the Dark Arts is named Moody when you know Snape is the Moody one. I mean, he's pretty damn moody himself. I think the name fits. Is he moody or is he mad? I mean, (laughs) he's mad-eye moody. He's both. Yes. (laughs) The Gryffindors are so anxious for their first lesson with Moody on Thursday that they show up early and are lined up before the bell goes. Hermione shows up at the last minute and explains that she had been, shockingly, in the library. What? They hurry into the classroom, and the trio sit directly in front of the teacher's desk. The little teacher's pets. Mm-hmm. Suck-ups. They pull out their copies of The Dark Forces, a guide to self-protection, and wait, unusually quietly. Well, I mean, as we remember from the past movies, all the kids wait unusually quietly for the teacher to come in, so there's that. It's unusual because that's not what they normally do, mm. so that's why the movie's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I don't think we needed that to tell us, but yeah. (laughs) The movie starts out as a grizzled Alistair Moody shows off his magic hurricane to his class full of students while he simultaneously refuses and asks for questions. Everyone continues to stare blankly at him as he proves the accuracy of his nickname. Both mad and moody. Mm Mm-hmm. And he's got an eye, so there's that. Just one. Just one, (laughs) yeah. (laughs) In the book, they show Moody entering the room... Preceded by clunking footsteps, looking frightening as ever, he tells the class to put their books away, which I think makes him less frightening. Mm Mm-hmm. But he tells them they won't need them. Moody takes attendance and then mentions that Professor Lupin had sent him a letter detailing their lessons covering dark creatures. He proceeds to list off boggarts, redcaps, hinky punks, grindalos, kappas, and werewolves. All the old favorites. (laughs) The good old dark creatures. (laughs) The golden oldies. (laughs) Moody then remarks that they are very behind on dealing with curses, stating that he only has one year to teach them until Ron interrupts, clearly upset that he isn't staying. Moody smiles at him and regards him as Arthur Weasley's son before explaining that he will teach them for one year as a special favor to Dumbledore before going back to his quiet retirement. The movie just has him decide to start the year off slowly by making his first lesson all about the darkest of arts and probably one of the most triggering topics this particular class could be taught. Because that makes sense, right? Yeah. (laughs) He asks the class how many unforgivable curses there are, and Hermione, having lived her entire life in the wizarding world, shows a fear that only comes with knowing about them since birth. Because, you know, she wasn't raised as a muggle who has no idea what an unforgivable curse is at all. She knows all about them. She knows all about them. I think that showing the fear that she showed was odd. Yeah. But I mean, she clearly read all about them. Yeah. I mean, I can get her reading about it, but she looks like she's going to be physically ill. Right. And it's like, why? You don't... I. mm, Yeah. I'm just going to make random grunting noises. Oh, no. I gotcha. I'm with (laughs) you. Nevertheless, she doesn't even raise her hand or wait to be called on before blurting out that there are three. Which is interesting because the book doesn't start off saying there are three. Mm Mm-hmm. We're just cutting to the chase right here in the movie. (laughs) Streamline. Yep. 
Hermione answers his follow-up question, explaining that they are unforgivable, and Moody gets tired of hearing her talk and takes over from there. Well, can you blame him? Why are they called unforgivable curses? Because they're unforgivable. Yeah, I got that. (laughs) He goes on to say that the Ministry are a bunch of bitches, and there's no reason 14-year-olds shouldn't know how to torture and kill people. Well, it is slightly different from the book. Where he just starts discussing the curses. Mm -hmm. He doesn't ask how many there are or even call them unforgivable curses. He just explains that he wouldn't normally show them what illegal curses look like until sixth year. And that he's only supposed to demonstrate the counter curses. But Dumbledore thinks they can handle it now. And Mm -hmm. Dumbledore does what Dumbledore wants. Mm -hmm. And we're starting to learn that about Moody as well. Yeah. So... I say full steam ahead. The sooner they know what they're up against, the better. Yeah. I think we get why they get along so well. Oh, totally kindred spirits. (laughs) Indeed. The movie has a bit of this explanation when his morning pot of coffee really kicks in and he explains that they need to know how to cast, I I mean, defend themselves against these curses. (laughs) Because, you know, don't use them. Just, you know, you got to know what they're like and stuff like that. Sure. Mm -hmm. What do you think this is? Dermstring? (laughs) Obviously not. He then tells Seamus not to put his gum under the desk while not even facing him, which would scare the shit out of me too, if I'm honest. Seamus, who is not really that good at whispering, then gets pelted with chalk thrown by their completely level-headed new teacher. Oh, the old codger can see through the back of his head. (laughs) (laughs) That was terrible. Anyway. This is a reference to the book, but not the same as he actually called out Lavender Brown for showing Parvati Patel her horoscope under the desk. But it is similar since both demonstrate that Moody can see through things, be it the back of his head or desks. And you're across classrooms! In the book, Lavender blushes and Moody continues on asking if anyone knows which curses are the most heavily punished by wizarding law. So again, he's not calling them the unforgivable curses at this point. He's just saying these are the most punished ones. Mm -hmm. Several hands go up, including Ron and Hermione's. And Moody calls on Ron, who tentatively says that his dad has told him about one called the Imperious Curse or something, because Ron can't just say it with confidence. Well, yeah. Moody confirms this and responds that Ron's dad would know about that one due to the Imperious Curse giving the Ministry a lot of trouble in the past. Yeah, that would burn it into my head, too. (laughs) Also very similar to the movie, really. Moody readdresses the class and asks which curse they should see first. Instead of people raising their hands, though, he just approaches Ron and orders him to stand and give him an unforgivable curse. Which is slightly different since he didn't make him stand in the book. Yeah. Like in the book, movie Ron says that his dad did tell him about one and mentions the Imperious Curse. Moody confirms that Ron's dad would know about that one since it gave the Ministry quite a bit of trouble a few years ago. That's that's practically the same. I, I don't understand. What's going on? It, what is this? It corresponds. What? It's making our job easy. Or hard. Damn. But in order to demonstrate why the bad thing is a bad thing, he pulls a spider out of a glass canister on his desk and turns it into a Big ass spider with an engorgement charm, which is perhaps the worst charm to use on a spider. No perhaps about it. I think you can just say the worst. Facts. But again, this is similar to how the book had it, except the glass jar is in a desk drawer, not on his desk. Huge change there, I know. Mm -hmm. It also holds three large black spiders, not one creepy big ass spider looking crab thing. Which, I mean, I'm sure the one spider on Moody's desk in the movie would have preferred there were two other spiders to take some of these hits. But um, Yeah. <laughs> the spiders make Ron recoil slightly, and Moody reaches in and pulls out one of them, holding it in the palm of his hand so the class could see. He doesn't bother enlarging this one. Apparently, it's already big enough to make his point. Hey, all right. He just points his wand at the spider and mutters, Imperio. Which is Basically what he does in the movie, too. The lazy-eyed sadist proceeds to tap into his students' deepest traumas by cursing the enlarged eight-legged fucknope with Imperio. Madcap hilarity ensues. Because <laughs> it always does. <laughs> he sends it all over the room, landing it on students and making everyone go 
batshit crazy, either from fear or laughter. Sometimes a bit of both. Yeah, right? A little bit of everything. The book's not quite as dark as the movie, because that was really traumatizing. Yes. (laughs) Very true. Instead, the spider leaps from his hand and swings back and forth like he's on a trapeze. Mm -hmm. Then it does a backflip and lands on the desk, does some cartwheels, and starts tap dancing. And I would have really preferred to watch a spider tap dance than that giant ass fuck nope landing on kids' faces. (laughs) Yeah, I, I feel that. Even when it landed on Draco, and you don't like Draco, but you're still like, ha ha, ha spider on his face, spider on his face. It's just too easy to imagine yourself being in that position. Mm-hmm. It's too much. Yeah, don't like it. There's no real fear in the book, maybe from Ron a little bit, but everyone's just laughing. They just watched a spider tap dance. That's probably pretty fucking funny. I mean, I'm cracking up right here just thinking about it. You so. look like you're cracking I up. I am. Can't you tell this is my cracking up face? <laughs> But Moody growls and pointedly asks the class if they would think it was funny if he did it to them. Laughter stops immediately. This is not funny anymore. Mm -hmm. And Moody explains that he had total control over the creature. He could make it jump out of a window, drown itself, or throw itself down one of their throats. Which is actually pretty similar to what he says in the movie, too. What? (laughs) This This is getting weird. Guys, what do we do? He tells them all of the gruesome deaths he could force the spider into, thus making his original point clear about the danger of that much power. Plus, in the movie, the class is also having a good time watching their classmates come face to face with the fuck nope until Moody starts making it weird and showing everybody why the power to control another creature could maybe be a bad thing. I think it's also important to note that movie Moody seemed to really enjoy traumatizing the kids. And that element was much more subtle in the book. Mm Mm-hmm. I have to agree there. But in the book, Moody tells them that years ago, a lot of witches and wizards were being controlled by the Imperius curse, and it was a tough job for the ministry to sort out who was being controlled and who was acting of their own accord. Again, similar in the movie. I've never had to say it this much in one episode. I don't know what to do. I know. I love it. No! No! It's probably the only time you'll hear us say that in that tone of voice. We'll see. (laughs) There could be some other moments. I'm not going to hold my breath, but yes, maybe. (laughs) He directs the spider back to his hand and tells the class that the Imperious Curse was used as an alibi scapegoat? Yeah, both work. Something. By a shit ton of Death Eaters to get out of being in trouble for eating death and whatnot. But there isn't really a way to tell the liars from the truthers, so it causes quite the legal headache for the ministry. Although, if there's a spell to see what was last cast by a certain wand, couldn't that spell be tweaked to show the last spell cast on a person? That's a good question. Mm -hmm. You'd think there would be a way to trace spells and curses placed on people, especially if that was a common issue. Yeah. Huh. That'd be a good Potter pondering. Ooh, I like it. I want to hear what everybody else thinks. In the book, Moody then goes on to explain that the Imperious Curse can be fought and that they will learn how. However, it would be better if they weren't hit with it at all. He then moves on and asks for another illegal curse. Hermione again raises her hand and surprisingly so does Neville. Moody calls on him, who nervously names the Cruciatus Curse. Moody looks at him intently as he confirms who Neville is, and I can only imagine what he's thinking here. Mm -hmm. This is that really subtle hint of how twisted he is. The fact that she mentioned that intent look. Mm -hmm. Granted, we don't yet know why, but we do. I mean, we do. So we're going to end up talking more about this later. Spoilers and whatnot. In the movie, he also asks for another unforgivable, and Neville doesn't raise his hand. Moody just completely randomly calls on him. Neville looks extremely nervous because, well, that's basically just his face at this point. (laughs) It is. (laughs) And Moody tries to connect with the boy by telling him that Professor Sprout thinks highly of him. Which is actually a reference to a comment later in the chapter and just sort of shoehorned in right here. It is a little bit awkward. And it seems to do little good as Neville stutters out the name of the next curse. Cruciatus. 
Moody says correct and has Neville come up to the desk for his front row seat to the eight-legged fuck no torture party. Which is another example of the more blatant pleasure he takes in traumatizing the students. Mm -hmm. In the book, he doesn't bring Neville to the front of the class. He just removes a second spider from the jar and places it on the desk. At this point, he does use Engorgio to make it larger so they can get the full fucked up effect. Nope. Full trauma in the movie. Fuck everybody up. You get a therapist, and you get a therapist, and you get a therapist. <laughs> Everybody gets 20 years of therapy. Except Snape. Fuck you, Snape. Well, yeah. <laughs> no therapy for you. No therapy, despite the fact he's probably the one who needs it the absolute oh, most. Oh, yeah, for sure. Moody casts the curse, and the spider lets out a hideous, piercing scream that causes all the dogs within a five-mile radius to start barking. Because it was really that fucking high-pitched. It was sad. Neville's face contorts in distress as he watches the spider writhe underneath the pain of the aptly named torture curse. Similar, though, the spider doesn't make any sound. It just begins to twitch horribly and rock side to side. Despite the silence, though, Harry is sure that it would have been screaming if it could. Mm -hmm. I think for the sake of the movie, the sound effect was very effective. If by effective you mean... That's kind of what it sounded like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it was rough. It was hard. It actually made me feel bad for the fuck nope. Yeah. And really, when it's something like a fuck nope, it's hard to feel bad for it. But yeah. you really do. Especially when you consider in the movie, it was just under Imperius. Yeah. <laughs> now it's being put that under thing. Crucio. It, yeah. Less torturous in the book as he spread it around. Mm-hmm. In the book, Moody holds his wand in place, causing the spider to jerk more violently until Hermione shrieks for him to stop. She's looking at Neville, who looks absolutely just aghast. Mm -hmm. And Moody actually responds and raises his wand. And though the spider relaxes, it's still twitching. It's similar in the movie. He looks as though he's about to burst out of his skin when Hermione and her eyebrows come to his rescue, shouting for Moody to stop. In the book, he says reducio to shrink the spider and returns it to the jar. He addresses the class and simply says pain, before explaining that if they could perform the Cruciatus curse, they would never need thumbscrews or knives. I like that he just assumes that all of them are going to need thumbscrews and knives if they can't learn this. Or that they're going to be torturing a bunch of people. Yeah. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> He asks if anyone knows any other ones, and Harry looks around the room, seeing everyone wondering what was going to happen to the last spider, apparently his least favorite. Mm -hmm. Hermione's hand shakes slightly as she raises it, and Moody calls on her. She whispers Avada Kedavra, causing several people to look at her uneasily. It just sounds uneasy, too. Like it's, yeah. It does not sound like a good phrase. No. Moody twists his mouth into a smile it is that subtle creepiness and describes this as the last and worst the killing curse he retrieves the frantic third spider who clearly knows what's about to happen to him mm -hmm. he knows what's up places it on his desk and raises his wand he roars avada kedavra Not and with a flash of green light the spider dies again this is not traumatizing enough for the movie so instead when Hermione shouts for him to stop, he seems to snap out of a torture-induced trance and ends the curse. Picking up the spider, he carries it over to Hermione's desk and asks for the last unforgivable curse. Because that's totally a normal thing to do. Oh, yeah. yeah. That's not creepy at all. Mm, or very creepy. It might be that. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're right. <laughs> I get those mixed up sometimes. Sometimes it happens. <laughs> For once, Hermione seems speechless and refuses to answer or look at the spider. So Moody just says, Avada Kedavra! And 86 is the fuck nope right then and there. Yeah, so that is definitely way more fucked up. Because mm -hmm. Hermione volunteered the information in the book. Yeah. She was willing to answer the question. Yeah. And then in the movie, they made her, like, afraid of it. Yeah, completely. Like... But it is possible that she knew very well that's what killed Harry's parents having read about it. I mean, and that's fine. There's this, like, level that she goes to that's beyond just sympathy. Right. I don't know. I just didn't like it. And it's not how it happened in the book, so. Fact. Ooh, ooh. Hey, we finally get to say that this time. Yeah. <laughs> Yay. 
Yay, I guess. <laughs> In the book, Moody explains that there is no counter curse and no blocking it. Only one known person has ever survived it, and he's sitting right in front of him. I wonder who it is. Who could it be? Hmm. In the movie, Moody explains that that is the killing curse, like we said. Only one person has been known to have survived it, but no one knows who it is. Just kidding. It's Harry. It's always Harry. Right? It's always Harry. Come on. It's always Why Harry. Why is it always you three? <laughs> He hobbles over to stand directly in front of Harry's desk and flicks his tongue while pulling out his fun flask to take a swig. Everyone looks at Harry, probably in both in the book and the movie. Yeah, more than likely. And he tries to ignore them, realizing for the first time this is how his parents had died. From his encounter with Wormtail and the Dementors the previous year, he knows his parents were betrayed. His father, James, had died first, trying to hold Voldemort off. Then Voldemort had asked Lily, his mother, to step aside, and when she wouldn't, he killed her too. Harry realizes that Moody's still talking, so he pulls himself back to the present to listen to what he'd been saying. And he's explaining that the killing curse needs a lot of power behind it, so he doubts he'd even get a nosebleed if any of them tried it on him. He then says that even though there's nothing to stop the curse if it was used on them, it was something that they had to know about. I mean, he's not wrong, though. It's just very morbid. It is very morbid. And I can understand being like, it's better to wait till they're 16 and closer to being of age. Yeah. Than 14, probably. But yeah, it just seems like bad timing, I guess. And I got the impression that he was doing the same lesson with everyone. Mm -hmm. Like, I know we weren't told what he taught Fred and George and Lee Jordan's class, but... Yeah. It still felt like this is what he showed them. Yeah, I could see that being exactly the case. And so at what point was there a cutoff or was he showing this to first years too? Yeah. I wonder. It makes me wonder. Oh, God. I like to think that he didn't. I don't know about that. Yeah. That, that makes me feel very unhappy. Potter pondering number two. Yeah. Let's see what everyone else thinks. Go with it. Moving on. Moody states that these three curses are known as the unforgivable curses because they are unforgivable. What? Wait a minute. We already learned that. Thanks, Hermione. <laughs> and using any of them on a fellow human carries a lifetime sentence in Azkaban prison. The class then spends the rest of the lesson taking notes on each of the curses. The bell goes and as the students leave, they begin to discuss them. Harry felt that everyone except him had just witnessed a spectacular show. However, he hadn't found it very entertaining, and neither had Hermione. Well, it'd be kind of weird if he did. In the movie, as they're leaving class, Ron gushes over how terrifyingly genius Moody is, because you can tell he's really been there. Which, Ron's attitude in the movie is reminiscent of their conversation at lunch with Fred, George, and Lee. Mm-hmm, exactly. About how he's been there amazing, which we talked about in the last episode. Yeah. So I'm yeah. kind of glad they threw that line in, since it references it. Mm-hmm. And it makes it really pretty clear that what we were saying before, that he's teaching everybody this. Yeah. So we're hoping it doesn't include the first years, but oh my gosh. Right. Who knows? But like I said, Hermione also did not find it entertaining, and she was very aware that Neville hadn't either. So she hurries Harry and Ron along so they can check on Neville, who's standing alone in the corridor staring at the wall, still looking horrified. That poor kid. Poor Neville. Poor Ickle Neville. Poor Uncle Nevillekins. Hermione says his name gently, and he responds in an unnaturally high voice. He, like, talking about the lesson being interesting and then asking what's for dinner and, like, mixing up words. Yeah. Very disoriented. Very disoriented. Very sad. I just, oh. Heartbreaking. <sighs> but before they can find out if he's okay, Moody clunks up behind them and asks Neville to join him for some tea. He also asks if Harry's all right, and Harry gives a very defiant yes. He's like, I'm yes. fine. <laughs> Not drinking your tea. <laughs> Moody tells them that it may seem harsh, but they've got to know, and he ushers Neville back to his office to look at some books. Yay, books after watching spiders get tortured. Right. And killed and all that. Fun. Mm. It's very similar to the movie. Hermione waxes angrily about the moral gray area that allows children to be taught unforgivables. 
While Neville is zoned out watching rain on the stained glass window, obviously not focusing on the gaping emotional wound that was just ripped open. Hermione tries to check on him, but Moody gets there first and offers him some tea and says he wants to show him something. Which, again, why wouldn't you go with the man who just tortured a spider? Are you going to show me candy? I'll get in your van. (laughs) Neville obviously has no problem being blindly led away by Moody, and the trio silently breathe a sigh of relief that they don't have to try to snap him out of his funk. And we then see that Neville was staring at the saddest looking stained glass window of all time. It was literally crying. It was. Just direct to literal imagery. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Completely. But this is where the movie section ends. The book, of course, goes on actually quite a bit more. What? Wait a minute. We were doing so well. New all. <laughs> New all. I knew we'd be back there. Yeah. Ron's confused about what just happened. And when Hermione doesn't have an explanation, he changes the subject to talk about the lesson. He catches the look on Harry's face when he brings up Avada Kedavra and falls silent until they reach the Great Hall before he finally says they better start on Professor Trelawney's homework that night because it's going to take them hours. He is really slow on the uptake, isn't he? He definitely has his moments. Yeah. I just hate that that's the only thing the movie decided to bring forward. Mm Mm-hmm. Of course. Hermione again eats all of her food ridiculously fast and rushes off to the library leaving Ron and Harry to walk back to the Gryffindor Tower without her. But this time, it's Harry who brings up the unforgivable curses, and he wonders if Moody and Dumbledore would be in trouble for showing students. Ron thinks they probably would, but says that Dumbledore has always done things his way and reckons Moody's been getting in trouble for years. I mean, he makes a valid point. (laughs) Right. Like, those two don't give a fuck. We already talked about that. (laughs) Like you said, preferring to ask for forgiveness than permission. Yep. They enter the common room and go up to their dormitory to retrieve their divination supplies. Inside, they find Neville, who seems calmer but has clearly been crying. Aww. Poor Neville. Harry asks him if he's alright, and Neville tells him that he's fine, just reading a book Professor Moody had lent him, Magical Mediterranean Water Plants and Their Properties. Professor Sprout had told Moody that Neville was good at herbology and thought he'd like it. Which we already knew in the movie because of the random factoid. She horned in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the random factoid that Moody decided to give us. It's interesting because Harry views this as a tactful way of cheering Neville up, considering how little praise he normally gets. Mm-hmm. And thinking it seemed like something Professor Lupin would have done. Aw, Lu- I miss Lupin. I know. Lupin. But that means the book used it more as a comforting him, making him feel better after the trauma, whereas the movie kind of used it as the confidence to induce the trauma. Right? Yeah. (laughs) Like buttered him up. Right. (laughs) Before he just tore him down. He and Ron take their copies of Unfogging the Future downstairs and begin working on their predictions for the coming month. After an hour and very little progress they decide (laughs) to go back to the old divination standby just make that shit up why mess with a good thing it's worked in the past (laughs) ron suggests to put in loads of misery saying trelawney will lap it up that is true together they predict a cough burns loss of a treasured possession being stabbed in the back by a friend coming off worse in a fight losing a bet because he was betting that he'd come off worse in a fight of course there you go yeah and then after another hour of steadily more tragic predictions harry notices fred and george hidden away in a corner working silently on something it's never a good sign when fred and george are working silently on something and this is very reminiscent of them being silent in the corner back at the burrow when they were working on things for the joke shop so yeah Is it related to that or is it something else? Is there something going on? I think it's something else because while Harry's watching them, he hears George quietly say they have to be careful and that they're risking sounding like they were accusing someone. Hmm. But George then notices Harry watching him and Harry doesn't want him to think he was eavesdropping even though he was totally dropping eaves. (laughs) Totally dropping some eaves. So, but he just grins at him and goes right back to work. And not long after that, the twins roll up their parchment and head up to bed. 
So not awkward at all. Wonder what's going on there. Will we find out more about that? Mm-hmm. Not in the movie, we won't. That's <laughs> <laughs> true. I kind of wish we did. Oh yeah, I definitely. Oh yeah, I definitely wish we did. I know it's not that important to the story, but. No, but it would be nice. And mm-hmm. it would give twins some more screen time. And yay, twins and having screen time. we could see James Corden as Ludo Bagman because we've already cast him in our heads. Exactly. Although if you talk to our patrons, it's pretty split between James Corden and... John Barrowman. And John Barrowman. Oh, which I'm not mad at either of those. I wouldn't kick either of them out of my film. No, not at all. I still don't like John Barrowman as a blonde, but I also really prefer brunettes. So... Yeah. That's part of it. And the only time I've ever seen him blonde was as a Nazi, and that does detract a little. That takes away from it quite yeah. a bit, yeah. But anyways. It sullies the memory, really. Not the point. <laughs> After about 10 more minutes, Hermione enters the common room, carrying a sheaf of parchment in a box that rattled as she walked. After explaining that she's just finished, Ron triumphantly tells her that he has two. Hermione proceeds to read through his predictions and remarks that he won't be having a very good month. That's to say the least. Especially since he's going to be drowning twice. Well, yeah. But Ron decides to change one of them to getting trampled by a rampaging hippogriff. Oh, well, that's totally okay then. Yeah, much better. Yeah, no worries there. Totally believable. (laughs) Or not believable at all. Well, but it's Trelawney, so totally believable if it's her reading it. (laughs) Hermione thinks it's obvious they made them up, and Ron pretends to be upset, claiming they've been working like house elves. Seriously, he is so oblivious. Yeesh. Total lack of tact. Awkward. Also, lack of tact is my new favorite phrase. (laughs) (laughs) And then here's an opportunity where Emma could have put her eyebrows to fantastic use. Mm Mm-hmm. Because all she has to do is raise her eyebrows to get Ron to backpedal. I mean, she already does that anyway. Right. It's... And they totally deprived her of a real eyebrow moment. Right. Very sad. But he tells her that it's just an expression. And Harry, who had just predicted his own death by decapitation, changes the subject and asks Hermione, what's in the box? What is in the box? Let's find out, shall we? We shall. Because the movie sure ain't going to show us. Yeah. <laughs> She lifts the lid and shows them about 50 badges of different colors, bearing the letters S-P-E-W. When Harry says spew, he's corrected by Hermione, who says that it's S-P-E-W, standing for Society for the Promotion of Elfish Welfare, a group she just started. Really? I would have never guessed that you just started that group. (laughs) This wasn't like a thing that people have been working on forever and that's why the house elves are still slaves. Right. It didn't already exist. What? Ron and has never heard of it. It's because I just started it, dumbass. (laughs) Ron again tries to tell her that house elves like being enslaved. I mean, just look at that sentence, though. Yeah. Like, that's so problematic. (laughs) Come on, Ron. Oh, be better. But Hermione just talks over him, so that's something. Hey. Go for it. (laughs) And explains that their short-term aims are securing fair wages and working conditions for house elves, which I think is totally legit. Right? The long-term aims include changing the law on house elves not being allowed to use wands and allowing house elves to be represented in the department for the regulation and control of magical creatures. I mean, house elves already have their own kind of magic, though. Do they really need wands? It's the same thing as it is for goblins. They don't allow goblins to use wands. Mm. And they can do magic without it, yes, but they could also expand what they know with it. True, okay. And if goblins are going to allow witches and wizards to use the magical tools and jewelry and all of that stuff that they can create, Mm -hmm. then the goblins should be allowed to use. Why shouldn't they be allowed to use the wands? It seems more like... They're at war with one another as opposed to living in harmony. Yeah. Basically. I wonder if that's going to be a thing later. And theoretically, witches and wizards can do magic without wands. Yeah. The tool just helps them direct it more effectively. Yeah. It centers all their power. Yeah. Which I understand. Maybe house elves could teach them how to do magic without needing a wand as well you guys we can learn from each other right one big happy family i think we just fucking joined spew (laughs) 
Harry wonders how they're going to do all of this, and Hermione tells him that they need to recruit more members, charging two sickles to join, which will buy a badge. And also fund a leaflet campaign. She's planned this all out. She's going all in on it. Lots of work in the library. Mm -hmm. She goes on to allocate the role of treasurer to Ron, who seems thrilled by that. (laughs) And Harry, as secretary, advising him to write down everything that she's already said as record of their first meeting. And she beams at them as silence falls over the room. Like, Ron is actually stunned to silence. Like, you're making me fucking what? (laughs) Yeah. There's so much wrong right now. (laughs) The silence is broken by a soft tapping at the window, which is Hedwig finally arriving with a response from Sirius. Well, it's about damn time. Harry takes the letter and reads it aloud, learning that Sirius is flying north immediately. Because there have been strange rumors, and he sees that Dumbledore got Mad-Eye out of retirement, so he's been reading the signs, even if no one else is. And he Mm -hmm. also specifically tells Harry to go straight to Dumbledore if his scar hurts again. Well. So short and sweet does absolutely nothing to make Harry feel better. No, not at all. Because Harry just now regrets telling him about his scar hurting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because he doesn't want him to get caught. Yeah, that's exactly what he's worried about. So now it's another thing added to his plate of worry. That boy's going to have anxieties. You get a therapist. (laughs) You get a therapist. The others try to calm him down, but Harry just says he's going to bed and leaves. Probably the right call at that point. Maybe. (laughs) Day's been a little rough. Yeah. In the dormitory, he changes into his pajamas and climbs into bed, unable to fall asleep, worrying that if Sirius gets caught, it'll be all his fault. Which, that's not fair. No, not at all. Like, I can understand worrying he'll be caught, but it, it's not his fault. It wouldn't be Harry's fault. I mean, there were other things that are bringing Sirius back, too. Right. A little bit later, Ron comes up, but neither he nor Harry say anything. The dormitory is completely silent, and Harry is too preoccupied to realize that the absence of Neville's usual snoring means he isn't the only one lying awake. That makes me so sad. I know. It's so sad because of little Neville. This is actually where the book chapter ends. Which will bring us to the new and returning actor section. Though we don't really have anyone new in this section, we do want to talk a little bit more about Brendan Gleeson as Alistair Moody, since this time we actually got to see him, like, in action. And holy shit. Right? That maniacal laugh Mm -hmm. was phenomenal. It was straight up giddy and damn near evil. And I loved every little hee 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 of it yeah he nailed it Mm -hmm. it was a little different than what i expected from the book yeah because he was more subtle in the book Mm -hmm. i don't think that the book was portraying him as having that much pleasure in the torture of the spiders and how it was affecting his students yeah yeah also i honestly i missed the shout of constant vigilance i am very disappointed that never happened i wanted that so bad especially because brendan gleason could have done that oh he could have growled the shit out of that right and then it would have been fun to see all of the kids jump Mm -hmm. whenever he did it he could have made that line his bitch oh yeah absolutely newell absolutely i'm gonna blame newell for it (laughs) (laughs) but yeah Again, he was phenomenal. He looked the part. The only difference from how he looked in the movie to how he was described in the book Mm -hmm. was the fact that his hair was supposed to be long and dark. Yeah. But it was still grizzled. It still, it suited him better, I think. I was going to say, it surprisingly worked. Yeah. Definitely. He was just great. They did some really good casting with him. And a hell of an actor. Mm -hmm. I feel like that wouldn't be an easy role to play. No, because, I mean, you're essentially playing someone, playing someone, playing someone. Yes. (laughs) Which we'll discuss later. We shall. (laughs) And now for this week's Potter Pondering. Yahoo! We ended up with two. Yay! The first one is, if there is a spell to see what the last cast spell by a certain wand was, couldn't that spell be tweaked to show the last spell cast on a person? And was Moody teaching the same lesson to all of the grades? Find the post on our Facebook page and share your thoughts. We really look forward to reading them. 
Our sorting hat story this week is from Samantha Rucker. She writes, Hi all, so my house is Gryffindor. Yay, lions! (laughs) (laughs) LOL. My wand is ash wood with a dragon heartstring core, ten and a quarter inches, and my patronus is a cat. Aw, kitty. I had a friend who told me about Harry Potter when it first came out. She told me I should read it, and I couldn't put it down. I kept up with all of them. Same with my mom. I fell out of touch when I was overseas. This was around the time the sixth book came out. I picked it up again a few years ago, and it reignited my love for this series. I couldn't stop listening to them. It was easier than trying to find time to read. Thanks for sharing your sorting hat story with us, Samantha. I, too, listen to a lot more books than I read nowadays, especially on longer car rides and when I'm trying to fall asleep. Yeah, thank you. I like to listen to books, too, but I fall asleep too quickly. If any of you other keepers out there listening would like us to read your sorting hat story on a future episode, you can email it to us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com. Let us know your house, wand, Patronus, how you got into Harry Potter, and anything else you might like to share with us. You can also just message us on social media. And that will bring us to this week's trivia question. What injured all three of the heads of the participating schools during the tournament of 1792? The prize for the first one who responds with a correct answer and the code word hashtag rampage will get a sticker. Another way to get a sticker is to rate and review us through iTunes. If you don't have an Apple account, you can write a recommendation on our Facebook page. Then email us at justkeeprolling at gmail.com to let us know you did and we'll get back to you to figure out which sticker you want and where to send it. And we did just add Kiss the Crook stickers to our collection. Oh, fun. (laughs) Don't forget to find us and follow us on Facebook at JKR Podcast and Twitter and Instagram at Just Keep Rolling. Following us on Podbean at justkeeprolling.podbean.com will get you the episode as early as possible and give you a leg up in answering the trivia question. If you'd like to support us as a patron for extra perks, you can go to patreon.com slash justkeeprolling. In addition to getting you some extra perks, like Just Keep Rolling swag, patron-only Facebook groups, virtual meetups, bonus content, and more, your patronage also helps us to continue producing this podcast, our cooking show, and bringing more content your way. As always, any support you can give is greatly appreciated. We also want to give a shout out to our newest patron, Kylie Kamioka. Welcome to the Just Keep Rolling patron family. We are so excited to have you join us. Oh my god, we can't wait to get to know you better in the group chat and whatnot. Hopefully we haven't already scared you off. That's entirely possible. We are kind of scary sometimes. (laughs) (laughs) And also, if I didn't get your name right, I had her send me a phonetic spelling of it, but Mm -hmm. if I mess it up, correct me and we will correct ourselves because we want to get our keepers' names right. I'm always down with correcting Ellen. She doesn't get too often, so. Exactly. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel, where we post our weekly podcast episodes, cooking show episodes, monthly blooper reels, vlogs, and other random videos. And join us next week when we talk about Chapter 15, Beau Batons and Durmstrang, and the corresponding film scenes, even though we actually already watched them because they totally happened earlier. (laughs) Thanks for listening. We hope you hear us again. I'm Katie. I'm Ellen. Until the next time, just just keep keep rolling. rolling.